So my name is Yaroslav Ustinov. I am solution architect in AWS. And today we are going to talk about the event-driven architectures in general and uh, how to build event-driven application in AWS specifically. Right? So what tools to use, what approaches to use. And uh, before we start, uh, I would like to ask, could you please raise your hand if uh, you're familiar with event-driven approach in theory? Read something. Okay. Now, could you raise your hand if you built an event-driven application on AWS already? Okay. <laughs> Tough public. And then, could you raise please your hand if um, you definitely know that Kafka is the only source of this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm lucky today <laughs> because these guys <laughs> definitely would know <laughs> much more than me. Okay, so um, before we start, I would like to share some personal story. In fact, it's a story was shared by, by one of my colleagues, but it resonated me, so I decided to share it with you as well. So I'm a lucky father of a five-year-old daughter, and uh, she liked dancing, and uh, she's going to the dance school twice a week. She likes it, it's no problem with that. But what is the problem every time is take out her from home. So how I would like it to have if I would just ask her something like, it's time for the dancing class, right? <laughs> and in response, I would receive something like, okay, let's go. <laughs> but it's never ever happened like that, never. What happened actually is First of all, I need to put a direct command. I need to say something like, please go search your shoes, for your shoes, right? And she's going to her room, and then no return. <laughs> <laughs> then I chase her to that room, uh, and I need to be more specific now, right? So I'm telling something like, okay, go to your wardrobe, get out your yellow shoes, and let's go. And the answer this time can be, I don't want to wear yellow shoes today, I want red, right? So I have to be, I have to change the request again. And now I'm, I'm saying something like, okay, it will be red shoes, but the answer to this, this time can be like, no, I'm not interested, I'm doing the princess, right? I have a try policy, it's okay, so I'm trying my request. But after that, the answer will be, no, I, I need to finish the princess, it's serious stuff, you know, so. And so I'm keeping to retry, keeping, keeping, so I'm retrying, 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 and uh, after that, I have throttling, service is down, I need to reboot, I need to escalate to the mother, so you know, I have all those three in my home, so you can imagine. And that's uh, an illustration of uh, command oriented approach, right? So I need to put the direct command, I'm waiting for the immediate answer, and then uh, I need to deal with the failed request, I need to deal with the failed service in the end, right? So I need to uh, think about service discovery, all this stuff. And my life would be much more easier if I could do like this. If I can stay in the center of the home and just announce, guys, it's time for the dancing class. And then I go and do my stuff for some time. And after that, I will receive some notification, then shoes on, clothes on, daughter in the car, we can go. And we can go, right? So that would be an ideal home. And um, now I think I illustrated how, uh, what, what challenges you can have in the distributed systems, right? So the first challenge is coupling, especially if you're using synchronous approach with API. So we used to think that microservices actually solve the decoupling problem, right? We have the monolith, we decouple it, now we have a bunch of microservices which are completely decoupled. But if your microservices, for example, you have two, right? They interact with each other, then they're already coupled already. And when you have more uh, complicated structure, then they're coupled even more, even tighter, right? And in the end, you can end up with the uh, microservice model, right? So it can happen. So it's very important to think how exactly your microservices will interact and how uh, coupling or interaction between, between them happen. And so, again, very simple picture, right? You have order service, we have invoice service, we have client, client put the uh, request to the order service, order service put the request to the invoice service, and everybody happy, right? We have uh, good answers for both of these services. Uh, 
Now we are growing, right? And now instead of one microservice, we have four. And uh, all of them interact with this orchestra. And in this case, uh, order service already took much more responsibility because it's responsible for interaction with all three services. So it, it needs to record them, it needs to collect the answers, process it in some way, and return it to the customer. So uh, even worse, because it's not always will be happy paths, right? So at some point, for example, invoice service can return that. And now you have to deal with the drive policy, you need to deal with the, what to do with the server, what to return to the customer, and again, right? So another story, and even more interesting, let's say we have these four custom services, which uses the data from the order services to build the predictions on the orders, right? And uh, today, for some reason, response times is really slow. And it affects the whole response of the whole service, right? So order will be slow as well. And what is interesting here is that actually order service do not, does not need the forecasting service. It's vice versa. Forecasting service who is using the data from the order service, right? But still, because of the response time of the forecasting, forecasting service, we have better response time from the order service as well. And now we're growing again, right? So long term, we have a bunch of order services interacting with order service. So again, much more responsibility, much more things to do. So that's where events can help us, right? And uh, before we go further, I want to be on the same page with you in definition of event. If you ever saw any of our presentations about service, you know this slide, right? So it's like always there. So it's a very basic definition of the event, which is signals that the system state has changed. But I don't want to discuss the semantics of, you know, philosophical of uh, philosophical uh, meaning of that. Because in reality, in technical reality, events is just, just JSON payload, right? So it's just a block of data which moving between the microservices or inside the microservice and uh, which contains information of the current state of some entity or the change of the state, right? So one important property of the event is that it's observable, not direct. So in the previous example, we deal with my daughter, right? We deal with the uh, command oriented uh, approach where one person gives direct commands to another one and uh, waiting for the answer immediately. So it's like somebody said, Honza, please create my voice, for the answer back, okay, it's done, and provide some information to the symbols. In event, uh, uh, in events world, uh, events are absorbed. So how it will happen in events world is that some person comes into the room and say something like, well, customer just ordered the widget. And there are a couple of persons in this room. Some of them are interested in this room, right? So some of them will say, oh, okay, then I need to create an invoice, right? Somebody can say, then I need to send an email confirmation to the customer. And a couple of persons just don't interested in this event at all, because they're interested in the event of canceling the order, or you know, dispatching the order, something like that. And then this thing that this guy in the blue t-shirt he actually doesn't know who will consume the, his event. He just announced it, and it's just for him, he, he, he went to go his own business. So if we change a little bit our architecture and uh, use the event approach, now instead of direct commands, we will use order servers just send one event, right? That an order was created. Still, it's sending it to the, all these microservices. And uh, now, for the microservice on the left, we call it producer. For the microservice on the right, we call it consumer. But still, there are many errors, right? And still, much more responsibility on the other side. Because it's still responsible for the sending this event. It should know to what consumers it should send it. And, uh, oops. And uh, that's where uh, uh, that's where even wrote comes into play, right? So to to explain why we need even wrote. So in the previous example, we have one producer and lots of consumers. In this example, we have two producers and two consumers, and things already became a little bit more complicated, right? But if you are grown, you can end up like this. And if you see such a diagram on the architecture, 
you have a big problem, right? So because it's impossible to understand what's going on. And uh, if you put a controller in the middle of that, the things become much more clear. And you can think about the event router as a pipe where producers put the events on the left side, and consumers consume these events on the right side, right? What is uh, good here is that actually producers don't know or know nothing about the consumers. Producers just, their task is just put their events into the pipe and that's it. The same about the consumers. Consumers don't, uh, know nothing about the producers. Their task to consume these events coming from the uh, event bus, right? From the event role. So that allows you to abstract producers from consumers completely, right? And the task of the event router is to route these events, as you can imagine. So basically, event router is responsible for the delivering these events to the consumers who, is, who are interested in these events, based on some set of laws, as an example. Also, event, uh, event router can be responsible for the repair policy, right? So if events cannot be delivered, it can be tried. Or this event can end up in the deadline that we have today, right? So that's two main goals or properties of the event router: it abstracts producers and consumers, and it selects and filters. Uh, if it comes to AWS and to AWS services, which you can use for the event routers, there are two of them: it's uh, Amazon SQL Notification Service and it's another package. So. I think everybody familiar with this notification service because it's uh, quite old and uh, a lot of people use it to deliver notifications uh, to, to the consumers on the phone, to the mobile phone, to the email. Uh, but also, actually, SNS has a feature to, sorry, run back again, has a feature for the message filter. So basically, you still need to put these messages in the correct topic, but inside this topic, you can have multiple, uh, you, have, you can have filter policy, and then specific messages can be delivered to the specific consumers, or to the specific customers. Uh, now, I will talk a little bit about event bridge, right? Because that's, is, from my experience, a lot of customers uh, don't know about that, or know almost nothing about this service, right? It's relatively new. We are most of, we, we, uh, it, it was uh, announced two years ago, probably. So that's uh, the event router, which has uh, producers on the left side, consumers on the right side, and then uh, event buses in the middle, right? So in, ter in terms of the event bridge, uh, producers are event sources. It can be AWS, native AWS services. It can be custom events for the application. You can, just, you can just put it into it. Or it can be SaaS application for the partners. Now, uh, in the middle, we have buses. So bus is that pipeline. I, I, I uh, described you when, when I was talking about the event also, right? So again, there are three types of buses, and we'll talk about it in a second. And then uh, uh, there are routes where you specify what events should come to what consumers in the end. And uh, in the end, there are targets uh, for consumers, right? So where these messages should be delivered. And uh, among these targets, there are, um, if you use Fizzle Plus, uh, it was services. So, can deliver these messages to the, uh, to, by the way, another event bus if you want, to Lambda, to step functions, and so on and so forth. So we were talking about the events. That's how event can look like, right? So JSON hello, something like that. And that's how the rule can look like. So that rules, that specific rule specify that uh, the, the, the events with the source like that should come to the specific targets, right? Or these rules, for example, specify that the uh, events from the department's drilling off of the event should go to the specific uh, And here you see that filter does not match because uh, this rule is configured for specific result, but you have event with specific field, right? So it's another type of event. So this rule 
uh, will not be applied to that class. And so there are three types of buses. So it's default bus. Default bus uh, exists within the Elmos account. So whenever you create Elmos account, you have default bus inside. And uh, uh, primarily, it's used by native Elmos services to put their events in. If you remember, we had cloud wash events before. Now we have the default uh, event uh, uh, bus for that. And so uh, you can basically create a rule to process these events from the native Elmos service. Right, like instance was created, or even uh, user user was created, right? Something like that. Uh, you can also put custom events there if you want, but for that specifically, we have custom buses. So custom bus is, is a bus you are created, and then you can put your custom events with your application there. And in the end, there are SaaS buses. So that bus is specifically for third-party SaaS events. Like you can you can uh, you can put events from Data dog from Greenberry and from Bridget, so from the list of the sub yeah. Uh, yeah, that's same. Okay, so uh, another feature of the event bridge is uh, schema and schema discovery. Because if you think about it, when your architecture is growing, you have more and more events and different types of events, and you need some kind of registry to store them, right? And also, you need to validate these events in the from the consumer side. That's a little bit odd. So for that, we have schema. So you can uh, describe your event schema using an open, open API uh, to the top or JSON. And then we have a schema registry, which you can create and put schema in, right? Also, again, if you think about it, imagine you have an event with 100 fields. Of different types, with nested entities, right? If you come to, to the developer and say something like, you know, I want you to create this schema description using a PS3.0 for such an event, probably the developer will say, well, I have more interesting stuff to do, right? So for that, we have the feature which is called schema discovery. So if you activate it on the bus, you can start to send the events to the event bus, and the event bus try to identify what kind of schema you have. So basically, it builds the schema for you. You don't need to specify it manually. And then you can again store it in the schema registry and use it. And uh, for schema registry, for schema specifically, there are uh, code beginnings providers for Java, for Python, for TypeScript, and developers can, can uh, work with this code beginnings in their uh, favorite ideas, right? or use it in lots. So now the question is, we have two services, what to use, right? Whether it's SMS or EventBridge. And again, there is no like general rule how to identify it. But uh, I would say when you need to have million subscriptions, right? So million consumers basically, then uh, SMS is a good way to go because it's possible. And uh, when it comes to the event bridge, it really shines when it comes to the interaction between the AWS services because it has, like I said, a lot of uh, more than 15 AWS services and targets. SMS doesn't have that. Right? So also, if you need to integrate your application with the SaaS service, like I said, it is a support of the SaaS uh, of the partner process, and you can do that. Also, there are some uh, differences in, uh, for example, rules because uh, SMS can uh, filter all it uses the metadata fields where event bridge is more flexible in that way you can use you, you can filter events basically using the whole JSON, right? Now our architecture can look like that, right? So we put event order in the middle uh, of an out and now we decoupled producer from the consumers, right? So we don't have to decouple properly. Uh, and also a little bit about the inverse service events here, just to finish with the, with the routers, right? So we were talking about the, the, uh, the interaction between the microservices, but if, in fact, you can use the event-driven approach inside the microservice, right? So let's say we have some more or less default setup, Amazon API gateway, Lambda function behind it, 
create this order. And then this lambda function also put the uh, event to the CMS topic, right? And then the CMS topic uh, can put this, uh, so we have this case which is subscribed to the CMS topic, and then we have process order function which basically processes it, right? And with this approach, it's relatively easy to add some new functionality to the function search, right? So as an example, search on analytics platform. So again, you just added a new queue, new function if you need it, and then using the things that are part of you can put your uh, data into the search. So again, it's just you know, simpler than re rebuilding the lambda function. Now, uh, what about availability, right? So what, what we, how we, we can improve our availability? So now imagine again, Let's back to that. The basics, again, we had our architecture, order service, and voice service, but now invoice service is going to be added. And that means that order service, will, order service will return the server as well, right? So that happens because in this uh, example, we have synchronous commands, right? So we have put request to service A, so we say put request to service B, waiting for an answer, and Vice versa. Uh, in a synchronous event, in a synchronous approach, in event driven architecture, you don't have this problem because service A actually will return the answer to the client, will return the response to the client uh, before before the answer from the service B is coming, right? So it, it's not waiting for the for the response. And uh, if we put Again, event bridge between order service and voice service in that example, right? So what will happen? Our client put the order, order put an event, an event bridge, and event bridge immediately returns the answer, okay, I will process your message, right? And then order service can return the answer to the client, client is happy, order is created. And then sometimes after that, uh, invoice service will get the event from event bridge. And even in case of failure here, uh, order is still will be created from customer behavior, right? And now I see the question. Because if invoice uh, invoice service failed, then we don't get the we as a customer won't get the invoice, right? And it's true, and in some situations you need to get the answer from another metro services immediately. And then maybe it's not the fun, maybe it's not the case for the event driven. But if you can to postpone it, uh, so that's, let's look into the invoice service inside, right? So it's very simple picture, but usually in general, microservices looks like that inside, right? So we have some business logic, uh, which puts some data into the data store and then uh, sends a response to the dumpster services. So, in this scenario, if uh, our service is not available or business logic failed, then event will, event will be lost and then error returns back, so nothing will happen. But what we can do, we can put event store in front of the business logic and then what will, and, and use the pool, um, uh, the pool model. So basically what will happen is that um, event will be pushed to the event store and when business logic or microservice is, is able to process this event, or events, if there are multiple, many of them in the, the, in the event store already, then it will do it. Maybe later, so, but still, they will be processed at some point, and you will not lose. So that's the sort component of the event driven architecture, right? The event store. Uh, now, if it comes to the Google services, um, there are more of them for that, and uh, I split it to the native services and the managed topic services, right? So, and also, uh, there are services for the queues, such as Amazon Simple Queue Service, or Amazon if, 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 if you want to work with the managed topic source. And for the streams, it's Amazon Kinesis Data Streams and Amazon uh, Managed Kafka. Uh, well, in, in if it comes to the differences, there are much more of them between these two. For example, for Amazon Kinesis, actually, we can have multiple consumers, 
and uh, you can do some kind of event tracking. So basically, if you need, you can use Amazon Kinesis as a uh, event author as well. As for the Kafka, I asked the, you a question at the beginning, right? What can the sources do? So of course, Kafka can be used like that as well. So it's it can be used as an event store uh, tool, but it can be used as an event author as well. Um, so now our final architecture will look like this, right? So again. Simplified, but still. So we have event router in between, and we have event stores for the, each of the microservices. So we put the availability and the availability of our application. Yeah. Now, a little bit about the event itself, uh, about the event itself, and how it's structured. So first of all, when you uh, when you're thinking about what event will look like, right? Uh, you have two choices. You have in general, right? So uh, you can uh, have a very short event as an event. So it will contain very basic information about what happened. So order or decree was created and it's, it's described by custom and number. Right? Another approach could be uh, put full state description. So in addition to this basic information, you will provide what is the status of this order, what is the total, maybe even list the items, and, and so on and so forth. <coughs> In this case, uh, you need to be sure that you know how to handle with the situations when, when, event, when, when such event will be processed, then the data inside of it will not be actually involved because something changed in the, for example, status, right? So because these events can be uh, processed not immediately after some time, we just discussed a few minutes ago. It, it, can, it can be an event store. So if you design it like this, then you need to, to, uh, to know how to deal with that. Uh, and you can ask like, okay, if it's problem, let's go like that, right? But problem here can be like, if you provide only very simple, or very simple information and rely that the consumers will request the additional details if they need. So for example, okay, what are the details for the then yes, these details will be actual because you just provided it, but uh, you need to be sure that you, you will not be overloaded by such requests, especially from the consumers who needs really basic details and uh, the data that can be actually longer than you know, the steps of the process. Uh, also, uh, regarding the structure of the event, uh, hopefully or usually your architecture is evolving and then you can end up with a different version of the event, right? So it's good to include this version inside the event because then you can uh, configure your rules inside the event bus in a way that only consumers who already can uh, consume events of version two will consume it. And all others will, will still consume the event of version one. It's separate, right? And that allows you to uh, change the consumers in the framework of the previous uh, Now a little bit about the anagram of the event, how it looks like, right? So uh, it consists of the envelope metadata and the actual payload, so information about the event itself. And uh, in envelope, there are a bunch of managed attributes, such as uh, unique ID of this event, uh, of what account it came, so and then uh, the field source is usually used for the service that created this event. If it's custom event, you can put there whatever you want. But if this event came from the native AWS services, then the uh, AWS service has been created there. The same about the detail, detail right? So usually, uh, if, you, if it's custom event, you put there the event type, but in, in uh, case of uh, AWS service, it will be specific event type of this AWS service. And uh, as for details or payload, it's just any value to storage. And uh, a little bit about the design consideration that was actually put in the presentations, right? So the first, uh, you need to think about the service factors. Uh, so the most common scenario, uh, you are using the services that guarantee you at least once delivery, which means event can deliver twice or even three times in some. And uh, then you need to be sure that 
you have a logic that detects the duplicate events and uh, basically deliver them. So you don't you don't create two single orders in our case, right? So again, the event bridge is in a standard test and test -to standard can provide for that. But if you need exactly one delivery, you can you can use another services like this or SQL Spyfall or with some efforts, Kafka or Antonio. Then again about the ordering semantics. Whether you need an ordered event, so you don't care in what order they came. And again, the ordering bridge is in a standard case of SQL standard can, can provide you that. Or you specifically need an order. Uh, stream of events, right? And again, in that, in that case, we would like to use Messias as the spider. Now, uh, a little bit about the, how to design the event classes, right? So the questions very often is like, how many classes should I have for my application or for, 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 for the whole workload, right? And so you are not restricted by that. You, I would say it's not silver bullet for that. You can put everything to the default event class because it exists, you, you don't need to create it, it's always there. But it can be a situation when you will be overloaded by the number of the rules you have there. It will be very really hard to orient you. Or you can create custom buses for different applications, right? So that also can be a case. So what you need to avoid so what is anti-pattern actually is to, uh, to to make your services actually actually root you events. So when services are responsible for what event bus, they need to put these events depending on something. So that's exactly the pattern we would like to avoid because we we have event orders to them, right? So they will be responsible for actually that. And the uh, general recommendation would be to align your um, your event buses with the user domains, right? So for example, for order management, we will have one bus for user administration, we'll have another bus and so on and so forth. Also, uh, what is good is that uh, when you provision event bus, you can provision event bus itself separately from the rules. So the cloud formation, for example, a separate so you can you can provision the event, uh, event bus itself, and then add the root. And when it comes to the cross account events, uh, there are two approaches. So you can put directly uh, events from the producer to the local event bus as a different account. But again, it's something we would like to avoid because again, it's routing on the producer side. But, it, uh, but what you can do, uh, you can put these events into the local event bus in this account, and then it will be routed to the other uh, event buses in the default account. Approach. Now, it's time for demo. This internet will allow us. So here we have the address console and we have okay, okay. Okay, so we have the event bridge here. Right? So uh, that's uh, the event passes I was talking about. So I have only one, an entry and default, of course. And here, the rules. Right? And so also, uh, let's create, uh, I would like to show you the uh, schema discovery thing, how it looks like and how the schema looks like. So let's create the event bus. 
reach real name. Okay. So now we have a tool called event generator. We use it for the workshops to generate different events and put it to the event class, right? So here, if we refresh, we will see our new discovery bus. Oh, and one, one more thing I forgot to do, so for that, uh, we need to enable the uh, single stop, right? So we need to start discovery for this specific event. Why you, need, why you need to do it explicitly? Because it's different prices. So if you switch it on, then uh, you will pay for the uh, event discovery additionally to the process events. And uh, actually, a little bit about that. So usually, this feature, uh, customers uh, turn it on what, in the development side. So basically, there are existing events coming from different microservices, and you would like to have the uh, schema so easy. Right, so you will turn it on from the development, uh, gain the, all the schemas list, with the schema registry, and then in production, you know, because you already have the application to deal with these events. But there are cases when you want to have it in production. And these cases is that when you want to be notified if your schema actually changed for some reason. Let's say, for some reason, somebody accidentally changed the event coming from your own application, right? And what you can do, you can turn on the, <coughs> the schema discovery and then put an event about, about schema change in the separate event bus and then process it. Let's say, send the notification to somebody about that the event schema change. Okay, so I turned on the, the uh, schema um, discovery. And now I just put these events into the event bus. So this event bus is not aware of any uh, of, of schemas, right? Let's do it, do it twice. And then, unfortunately, uh, we need to wait several minutes until the schema discovery happens. So it's not happening uh, immediately. And while we are waiting, what we can do, we can create another event bus for, di for different purpose just to, s to show you how the rule uh, works. So, Let's create another one. Now we go to the rules. Choose this new event bus and create the rules. So let it be test <coughs> rule. And uh, here you see we have a predefined pattern depending on the service and we can choose the service itself, whether it's AWS or some service partners, or you can customize uh, your pattern, right? Using JSON like I showed you before. And here we are going to process only events came from the specific location, right? Like that. So whether it's US or US. Uh, what else? Here we need to specify the targets. And for that purpose, I already have a step function that's configured here. But you can see, right? So there are a lot of targets. Uh, and then specify the specific state machine. And that's it. You can add another target if you want. After five targets, oh, okay. and uh, using the same event generator, we just put the same event, uh, but with a different event bus. So it's US. So one, two, and now let's change it to US. So now we can go uh, <coughs> check if our state machine was indicated twice.
Well, the first one, you can see from the time, it was my best one, right? But yeah, it was allocated twice, and after I put three then, because the third one was not that set by the rule. It was for two computations. So it's a function that successful. And in the meantime, we can return to the event bridge. Hopefully, it's have a discovery already happened. So schemas, discover schema registry. Yeah, here it is. So you see it's schema from that event I've sent was discovered. And here are the specification of this event. So what what, uh, what fields it has, what type of these fields, what the format, and so on and so forth. Uh, it could be version, first of all, and then uh, what I was uh, what I told you about is that you can download the code binder for the different languages. So it can be Java, it can be Python, it can be TypeScript 3. I will try to show you how it looks like. I know there are a lot of data scientists here, so you're familiar with Python. I So that's for the unification object for our scheme we just discovered. <coughs> and we can use it here uh, for validations. So that's it for the demo. So now we come to the conclusion. So basically, when we talk about the event-driven architectures, uh, we are talking about three very important things. Right? So we have uh, we are talking about the event routers, which allows you to abstract producers and consumers from each other. We are talking about that our lines should be asynchronous, and uh, we are talking about event stores to buffer messages, give preserved messages until services are able to process. So that's important things. And uh, as for benefits. As usual, it's scale and fail independently, so event uh, architecture allows you to do that. Uh, the benefits are agility, obviously, because now your services can be completely decoupled and developed by different teams. All you need is to put data contracts instead of API contracts, right? So on the uh, You can audit this because actually you can follow the list of the events which happened, and you can uh, identify why this uh, entity in this specific uh, state, right? Because you, need, you, you can go through the events and understand how, how it happened. And it can cut costs because uh, most of the tools, except Manage Kafka and uh, Amazon FQ, are serverless. So it's based on basically your cost, if you build something like that, will, be built, will, be, uh, will depend on the number of events you're processing. So, it's relatively easy to calculate uh, what amount of money you will pay for that. That's it, on my side.